I'm Brian Harding. I'm the Deputy Director of the Southeast Asia Program here at CSIS, where we also examine our critical relationships with Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific Island countries. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the CSIS Pervamina Banyan Tree Leadership Forum this morning with the Senator, the Honorable Matt Canavan, Australian Federal Minister for Resources in Northern Australia. Today's event is hosted by the CSIS Energy and National Security Program and the Southeast Asia Program, and is made possible with support from Pergamina. We're so pleased that the minister could find time to join us this morning. Uh, as we heard earlier, he's had an excellent week already, great meetings with Secretary Perry, Secretary Zinke, I'm sure he'll tell us about. After the minister's remarks, my colleague Sarah Ladislaw, the director and senior fellow of the CSIS Energy and National Security Program, will moderate the discussion. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to make a brief announcement regarding safety. Uh, in the unlikely event of an emergency, I will act as your safety officer. If the emergency is to my left, uh, please exit through the main lobby and meet outside St. Matthew's Cathedral on Rhode Island Avenue. And if the emergency is on my right, please make your way to the National Geographic Building on Canada Street. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Minister Matt Canavan. Mr. Canavan was sworn in as Minister for Resources in Northern Australia in 2016 after serving in the Senate for three years. As a Senator, he has served on a number of committees, including Human Rights, Public Works, and the Legislative and Reference Committees for Economics. He first entered public service 15 years ago as an economist for the Australian Productivity Commission, where he quickly rose to the level of director. He was also a senior executive at KPMG and advised on large-scale infrastructure investment projects. From 2010 to 2013, he was Chief of Staff to then Senator Barnaby Joyce and managed the political office and provided strategic advice on policy. And with that, it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Canada to the stage to deliver the voting to deliver the us. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, thank, thank you so much, Brian. It's a, it's a great honor to be here at the Center of Strategic for International Studies to, uh, to talk to you about what I think are some of the most important issues uh, in the world today. Uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, I spent the week at, uh, or most of the week at CIRA uh, in Houston, my first time there, and uh, what is happening in terms of America's uh, expansion of its energy production and potential exports is really a game changer for the world. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that today, but also want to talk about how important mining is too and how important minerals are to our modern economy. I'm a bit of a Roman history buff and um, once I saw uh, that, a, once I noted that a German historian, Alexander de Mont, uh, once listed 210 reasons why the Roman Empire failed, why the Roman Empire collapsed. Uh, and one of those reasons, one of the 210 he had down was depletion of its mineral resources. Now I don't know how true that is, and there's a long argument in historiography about how the Roman Empire fell, but I do think our economy, our modern economy, uh, is much more reliant on minerals and mining and resources than Rome ever was. Take the smartphone, that I'm sure we all have. I've got a couple of them, I've left them over there. But uh, uh, take that phone, those phones over there that you've all got. There's about 25 minerals, different minerals and metals that go into the construction of that smartphone. One of them's a rare earth called neodymium. Uh, it, 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 it's what goes into the speakers of the, of the, uh, the smartphone. And without that, if it didn't have that mineral, all the sound out of your smartphone would sound really tinny. Uh, now, neodymium wasn't even a mineral that the Romans knew about. It was only discovered in 1885 itself. Uh, but even for those minerals that have been used since ancient times, we've got huge demand for them to fuel a modern economy. If you just take copper, we're going to need to produce as a world more copper in the next 20 years than we ever have in history before. More copper in the next 20 years than ever uh, before. It's an enormous, enormous task. Now, most of that growth and demand for resources is being is coming out of uh, and in response to the huge growth we've seen in our region, in Australia, in the Asia Pacific region in the last 50 years. And uh, uh, that's hopefully going to continue and hopefully fuel extra demand for minerals. And it may seem like a daunting task, how we're going to produce as much copper in 20 odd years as we have in all history, but we've done that in the last 50 years. We have met an enormous expansion of economic growth, uh, of, of demand for minerals in the Asia Pacific region in the last 50 years. And the way we've done that primarily is by supporting open, free trade and investment across countries that allows 
business enterprise uh, to find solutions to uh, those enormous demands. We're very proud and proud as the Australian Minister that we played a role in that process uh, in exporting a lot of our natural resources in that free and open way to support economic growth right through our region. It's ultimately the recipe uh, that can deliver economic stability, security and safety uh, for countries right across the world. Indus, it's good to see, it's good to see the US government also picking up this uh, this issue because last December the US government published itself a list of critical minerals, a draft list of uh, critical minerals that it saw as important to fuel its economy. They put together a list of 35 of those minerals and as I say there's some there that I'm sure you've never heard of that in, that in some cases have only really been known uh, to us for around 100 years. The information age that we have, that we're living in, is more has a more as demand for a more diverse and more complex list of minerals than ever before, certainly than the industrial age. I mean, even the most modern steam turbine with advanced alloys and metals uses about 11 different minerals, 11 different minerals. As I noted before, the smartphone uses 25. A, uh, a solar panel uses about 16 different minerals and metals. And of course, batteries rely on lithium and other new minerals for their production too. Of those 35 minerals that the US government identified as critical to your economy, China is the top producer for 19 of those. And it's the top supplier to the United States for 12 of them. A sensible risk diversification strategy for the United States would be to support a greater diversity in the production supply of these critical minerals. Australia at the moment is only the top producer for three of those 35 minerals. It's lithium, zirconium and hafnium. But we have identified resources for 14 of them in total. And for 13 of those minerals, 13 of those 35 minerals, Australia is in the top five countries in the world for demonstrated resources. We're likely to have resources for more than those 14 in Australia too, but it's just that uh, these are so new and the demand for them has picked up so quickly that exploration hasn't, hasn't, uh, hasn't kept pace with that, that change. Oh, for the smartphone that I mentioned before, Australia has 18 of the 25 minerals that go into a smartphone. We've got 10 of the 16 that go into a solar panel. And while China is the world's largest producer of rare earths at 105,000 million tonnes a year, Australia is the world's second largest producer at 14,000 million tonnes annually. And we have some of the world's best rare earth resources, including at a deposit at Mount Weld in Western Australia, currently being developed by a company called Linus. We're the largest producer of lithium in Australia. It's a key mineral, of course, for modern batteries. And our production of lithium has trebled in the past eight years, and we now produce 41% of the world's supply. For almost all of these resources, Australia and other countries have hundreds of years of supply at current rates of production, although that could be a little misleading given how fast demand is increasing for these. In any case, the advice I have is unlikely to be a shortage, a physical shortage, of these types of minerals within the world. The key risk is to making sure we have open and free markets to guarantee the supply of those resources for economies like the United States. On my Prime Minister's, on Australia's Prime Minister's visit to the US a couple of weeks ago, he signed an agreement, a critical minerals alliance with President Trump to increase the production availability of these minerals. And given our abundant potential supply, we welcome this commitment and we look forward to working with US officials on how we can further secure the exploration, extraction, and processing of critical minerals. Some critical minerals are the byproducts of traditional metal metallurgical processes. So they're not of themselves need to be mined separately. Take, for example, the mineral tellurium, which is used in the production of solar panels and semiconduct semiconductors. It's a byproduct of the production of copper, of the refining of copper. And other major minerals such as gold, lead, zinc, and nickel and iron are also potential sources of byproducts or byproducts of critical mineral production. Therefore, to increase the production of many of these critical minerals, we actually have to find new commercial sources of more well-known mineral deposits like copper, lead, and zinc. Now in Australia, our, our first big uh, find and development of copper was in 1859. And it was found when uh, a stockman uh, was uh, or a cowboy, I suppose you'd call him here, was, was, uh, was going around a property and he saw a wombat uh, digging up some rocks, just burrowing a hole as wombats do. 
and he noticed that those rocks looked a bit green, looked a bit weird. Went up and inspected those rocks and thought they might have something in them. Uh, and when he sent them off to be assayed, had a huge copper deposit at a place called Wallaroo. And while not all of our mineral discoveries have come from wombats, uh, <laughs> most of them have been discovered in the same way. Most of them, the, the, the way big mineral finds get made uh, is that people uh, notice and, and uh, see outcropping, see rocks that are poking through the surface and think, well, there might be something uh, more of that down below. And they drill wells, drill holes, assess the cores, and then develop from there. In fact, though, there's no scientific reason why there isn't just as many minerals, just as much copper uh, or gold or other, other minerals away from where the outcropping is. That's just happenstance. That's just a coincidence uh, that the outcropping is in those, those particular areas. So that means in a place like Australia, which is pretty big, we've only actually really looked at about 30% of our landmass where that outcropping exists. The other 70% of Australia has largely been unexplored from a mineral production perspective. Now, fortunately, there are some modern techniques available uh, to try and uncover that surface and see what is below. And there's no reason why there won't be large mineral deposits in the other 70% of Australia. And that's why we, as the Australian government, are investing $100 million to try and uncover that surface and make the new finds that will supply the mineral needs of the world. We would welcome cooperation with the United States on the development of these techniques as a part of the strategy to secure future supplies of critical minerals. This week, I've had very productive discussions, uh, as Brian mentioned, with Secretary, Zin Secretary Zinke uh, uh, on these issues and how we can work together to take them forward. We've agreed to, to, to work on a memorandum of understanding between your United States Geological Survey and our organisation called Geosciences Australia to identify the resources of critical minerals in our two countries and to share knowledge on the latest exploration techniques to secure more supplies of them. Now, the other critical resource for a modern economy that we need is, of course, energy. We need energy. While energy as a share of GDP has been falling in developed countries, many elements of a modern economy remain really energy intensive. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that example of a smartphone again, the ubiquitous smartphone. It takes about one gigajoule of energy to produce a mobile phone, to manufacture it, put it together. It takes about one gigajoule. And about two billion are sold every year. So it works out to be about two exajoules of energy. Bear with me with all these jargon, sorry. It'll make sense. But two exajoules of energy in total to produce mobile phones in the world every year. Now, just, to, just for to comparison to something that comes from the industrial age, compare that to cars. The manufacture of a car, of course, takes a lot more energy than the manufacture of a phone. It takes about 100 gigajoules of energy. So 100 times the energy is embodied in the manufacture of a car than is embodied in a smartphone. But, but, of course, there's only 70 million cars sold every year. And so that works out as a total of six, seven exajoules a year. So the mobile phones production used about two and, and, and cars seven. So even though on a per unit basis a car takes 100 times more energy, you know, and you'd expect that, but because of the size of the mobile phone market, the enormous size of it, and it's still growing, their production, the mobile phones, the production of mobile phones takes almost 30% of the energy that, that, it, that we use to produce cars in the world. Now, a lot of my friends on the environmental side of our aisle in Parliament, you know, they might like to think about using electric cars and uh, sometimes ride their bike and other things, but I don't think they're going to give up their mobile phone. They're not going to give up their iPad. Uh, they're pretty much now uh, required tools uh, for the modern information age. And to make those tools and for them to use them, they need an enormous amount of energy, an enormous amount of energy, and also all the minerals I spoke about earlier. And I don't think we're going to see reductions of energy use in our world anytime soon. Uh, it's true, of course ever since the industrial age started, been massive improvements in the efficiency of steam turbines, of electric motors, of the internal combustion engine. engine. But every time there is increases in efficiencies of the prime movers of the industrial economy, there's almost a bigger increase in the demand for energy as a whole. And that's going to continue, I think, with a combination, because we need to continue the production of products like smartphones, that we still have a billion people, or more than a billion people in the world, without access to electricity. 
And it's also the central, still the central lesson that uh, Stanley Yevons in 1865 outlined, the British economist, where he noted that just because steam turbines were becoming more efficient in their use of coal, they still led to, every time those efficiencies increased, a bigger increase in the demand for coal. As energy costs fell, as people found more ways to use the energy that was freed up by greater efficiencies. Now, I, I, I don't think forecasts about energy are all that, uh, all that accurate from time to time. I think probably the only accurate thing you can say about forecasts for energy is that they're almost certainly going to be wrong. And uh, they, 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 they definitely have been over time. Uh, so I wanna, I'm going to approach this next section of my contribution with a bit of trepidation and caution about what I'm going to say. And I'm almost certainly going to be wrong, but I suppose you want to hear my views, so I better, better put them on the table. But just take, take coal use at the moment. When we look back uh, at what's happened in the last, in this century, at the beginning of the century in 2000, the International Energy Agency forecast that worldwide demand for thermal coal in the year 2020 would be 3.3 billion tonnes of oil equivalent. By 2015, thermal coal use had already reached 3.8 billion tonnes of oil equivalent, 15% higher than their 2000 forecast and five years earlier too. Now, I'm not picking on the IEA, because I say I think everybody, uh, everybody's forecasts in this area are probably almost certainly going to be incorrect. And no one foresaw the rapid growth or as rapid a growth as we saw in China in the last 15 years. And coal certainly helped fuel the development of China and help, hence helped hundreds of millions of people emerge from lives of crushing poverty. I hope that economic growth can continue to surge. And I, I genuinely hope that we can continue to see people lift themselves out of poverty. We can continue to see countries follow the, the path of other industrial economies and provide better futures, better lives, safer environments for their people. But no country in the world so far, no country has lifted itself from poverty to prosperity but for a rapid increase in the use of energy in their economies and almost always that's meant an increase in the use of fossil fuels. So I think if we're going to predict about what happens tomorrow we're probably best to start with what happened yesterday. What happened yesterday? And in the last, in this century, has been an enormous increase and the demand for fossil fuels to fuel economic growth. Now, in the immediate future, we will see a greater use of renewables, as we have, but renewable energy cannot provide the spur to provide large-scale development of poorer countries. It is too unreliable and remains too expensive. The rhetoric on renewables often dangerously departs from this reality. And if we succumb to some of these fairy tales we like to tell each other, we will deprive developing countries around the world the same opportunity we have had and other countries have recently had to develop. Now, I don't think, therefore, I think those countries are going to uh, determine more about what happens in their uh, economies, more about what happens in terms of their use of energy than what we say here in, in Washington, D.C., or that I say in Australia. Because I think the people of Bangladesh, the people of Pakistan, the people of India, the people of Africa as well will want economic growth and will want to see that occur. And so what's going to happen in the future? Well, I don't know, as I said, but uh, the, 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 this idea that demand for coal and gas and fossil fuels is somehow on the decline is just simply wrong, and wrong by a long way. In the first 15 years of this century, the use of thermal coal has increased by 73%, and gas has increased by 42%. In the 15 years prior to that, thermal coal use only increased by 25% uh, and gas by 47%. So in the case of coal, it's been increasing in terms of its growth rates. As I said, a lot of that's due to the amazing growth we've seen in China. And that may not be repeated by India or other countries just yet. But the idea, the idea that's put forward by some serious commentators in this space that demand for coal is in structural decline is just clearly wrong. It's not consistent with the data. There has been a levelling off of coal demand as China's growth has slowed, but uh, taking a, a longer term trend view, the demand for fossil fuels continues to grow and continues to grow very strongly. Now the latest projections for fossil fuel use by the IAA and others don't forecast as big an increase in, in their use in the next 20 years, especially for coal. But given this past use and a very large amount of it used now, even just maintaining what we 
uh, currently produce, even if it just stagnates, there's a staggering challenge to deliver uh, these resources to the world. So I take the projections of the IEA. You take those projections. The world will need to produce as much thermal coal in the first 40 years of this century as we have in the whole history before, at least going back to 1800. These numbers are astounding, but it goes to show the level of energy demand that occurs in the world right now. According to data compiled by Vaclav Smil, the energy and a famous energy analyst, the world has produced about 5,700 exajoules of coal from 1800 to the year 2000. In the first 40 years of this century, estimates are that the world will need about 6,000 exajoules of coal, so more in 40 years than the 200 years before that. And that's on conservative assumptions of coal basically staying where it is. Now, I'm, I'm told um, that this, what does 6,000 exajoules mean? As I say, it's a bit jargon, obviously. But it's enough to fly from New York to Los Angeles more than 2 billion times in a Boeing 747. It's a lot of energy that we've got to produce. Now, we're lucky, we're still lucky that the world has abundant supplies of coal and gas, hundreds of years of supplies worth, and we should be able to produce these amounts for the world. A failure to do so would increase energy costs, limit economic growth, and prevents hundreds of millions of people from getting out of poverty. If the opponents of fossil fuels artificially prevent their production, that would increase energy costs, limit economic growth, and consign hundreds of millions of people to poverty. I don't want to see those outcomes. In practice, Fossil fuel opponents are only likely to stop production in developed countries where uh, their political uh, support is, is, is greater. And this is likely to have the perverse outcome of potentially increasing carbon emissions and damaging the environment. The more we limit our ability to produce the energy needs of the world, uh, the more, uh, more potential that we'll do so in ways that are less environmentally favourable. Now I've got a real world situation uh, about, uh, on this issue in Australia. There's a proposed coal mine in Australia called the Adani Carmichael Coal Mine. It's in a new coal basin. It's not connected at the moment to ports and infrastructure. It's about 29 billion tonnes of coal in this area. This particular mine is proposed to produce 25 million tonnes a year to start with. Um, the coal is set to supply a company called Adani, which is an Indian company. It's set to supply their power stations in India, so they're vertically integrated. Uh, they obviously, they're, they're partnering with the Modi government to deliver electricity to more than 300 million people in India that don't currently have access to it. Uh, they're building a lot of solar and renewables too, but they understand they're going to need thermal and baseload power as well, and that's why they're building significant numbers of coal-fired power stations in India, about 50,000 megawatts worth of coal-fired power stations on the latest estimates. Now, the coal at the Carmichael mine in Australia uh, uh, is better, is better by far than those that exist in India. India has a lot of coal. They've got no problems with supplies in total of coal. But their coal uh, is uh, of a lower energy quality than what exists in Australia, and it has higher ash content, uh, meaning that it would be delivered, delivered, that you'd have worse environmental outcomes delivered from its burning. So if the activists that oppose this mine stop this particular mine, that's a small mine in the context of the world. It's 0.4% of world production, but it's a good example. If they stop that mine, it's not going to mean India uses less coal. They'll, they'll get their coal from West Bengal, and, uh, uh, from, from their mines in the, in the east of their country. But it will be that coal that is of the lower energy quality. It'll, it'll mean that for every, every megawatt hour you produce from it, you'll produce more carbon emissions than the Australian coal, which is 50% more energy, uh, has 50% more energy content as I said, it has a lot lower ash content as well. Now, of course, switching to gas-fired electricity in our region will have even greater reduction of carbon emissions as well. Combined cycle gas turbines produce about half the carbon emissions of even the most efficient coal-fired power stations. But again, there are ignorant and ill-informed campaigns against the production of gas all over the world, and that's the case in Australia too. Here in the United States, you are unlocking a lot of gas, which is a great thing for the world. In my part of the world, we have potentially just as good resources as you do here. We have a large shale gas basin in the Northern Territory, and uh, some of my geologists think that it is, could be as productive as places like the Marcellus Shale here in the United States. Now, while I was at Sarah Week this week, there's a lot of interest in this resource uh, in Australia. Notwithstanding the big increase in production you've got here, uh, uh, we are proximate to Asia. We've got the opportunity to supply the region as well. But at the moment, you can't drill in the Beetaloo Basin because there's a moratorium being imposed by the state government or the territory government in that location. Uh, 
They're conducting the fifth review in six years of unconventional gas techniques. All of the previous reviews have concluded you can do this stuff. Uh, the science is clear. It can work with appropriate regulation and you can protect the environment. Now, we need to counter the misinformation that's spread about this stuff. The only reason this moratorium is in place is because a bunch of people run around with voodoo science arguing that this stuff can't work and will damage the environment when the clear evidence is from here and around the world that it, it does not deliver, does not, uh, uh, de does not deliver those poor environmental outcomes. Now we've become rich and prosperous in our country from the development of our natural resources. And in some respects, We've had a bit of a charm period in the last 50 years because in our region, we've really been the only developed country that's been exporting energy to the Asia Pacific world. So when investors look around about where they're gonna get or develop resources, Australia's always been very attractive because we're a developed nation, stable government, and we're proximate to Asia. I recognize that situation is changing. As President Trump said in his State of the Union uh, address, the United States is about to become a net energy exporter to the world for the first time since the 1970s. So Australia will face more competition to supply our Asia for its energy and other resources. While this is an obvious challenge to my country, it is something that should spur Australian industry to become more productive. I firmly believe competition is healthy and it's the best way to produce better economic outcomes. Uh, we, we, we have exported our resources to the world over this period, so we can hardly complain about another country uh, uh, doing the same thing. At the end of the day, imitation is the best form of flattery. Both the United States and Australia will benefit uh, from a more secure and prosperous region. And the more we can supply affordable and cheap energy to the region, the more likely we'll generate that outcome. So if cheap energy from the United States can help underpin economic growth in my part of the world, that is a good thing. It will also help the Australian economy expand as well. Australia should cooperate with the United States on the development of better functioning energy markets in our region as well as the agreement on critical minerals that my Prime Minister signed with President Trump. We also agreed uh, to form a partnership on energy in the Indo-Pacific region. This partnership is a high level agreement between Australia and the US to work together to promote regional infrastructure development and energy cooperation, uh, to develop open and competitive markets and improve rules and standards in the Indo-Pacific. We have three priorities for the next two years in our work plan including energy infrastructure development, deployment of low emissions technologies, and the development of open and rules-based global markets for natural gas. The partnership also works with the Japan-United States Energy Partnership and Japan's commitment to invest $10 billion to develop LNG infrastructure in our region announced in October last year. While we will compete with the United States to supply energy, it makes sense for us and other like-minded nations to cooperate in our region to develop energy markets. There is a strong rationale for Australia, the United States and other countries to form a broader alliance that seeks to promote the use of more efficient and hence more environmentally friendly fossil fuels. If we can increase the size of the energy and economic pie in Asia, we will all benefit. The best way we can underpin economic growth in our region is to promote the wide availability of natural resources. This includes promoting a diverse source of supplies of minerals and energy and we have a template of success of how to do this from the past. The rapid economic growth of Asia that's occurred since the Second World War has been underpinned by free and open trade and investment of natural resources. We continue to believe that that's the best way to underpin the growing needs of developing countries and also to provide benefits to those countries exporting resources. Stable markets and relationships will also promote cooperation and will encourage innovation and efficiencies. Greater efficiencies will help us reduce carbon emissions and improve environmental outcomes. The proven method to improve the environment is to deliver economic growth. If you've got the resources and you're a strong economy, you will protect the environment. Ultimately, the best environmental policy is the best energy policy and the best economic policy. The outcome of this debate could determine where hundreds of millions of people fall on the lines of poverty or prosperity around our world. So I'm very committed to this cause, to increasing energy use, responsible energy use in our region. When I, when I first became a senator uh, uh, three and a half years ago, it was an American company called Ben & Jerry's, you probably know it, American company Ben & Jerry's, who are running a campaign in Australia against coal mining. Their campaign, their slogan was uh, scoop, scoop, scoop ice cream, not coal. <laughs> it was catchy, it was catchy. But you know, I get a bit frustrated by it because my region, where I'm from, we do a lot of coal mining, we have a lot of jobs in coal. 
And I thought, who is this American company? Come and lecture us about what we do. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, OK. They're making a moral claim that eating ice cream is more moral, more, uh, more ethical than, than mining coal. All right, well, let's, let's put them up against each other. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, what is the moral purpose of ice cream? What is it? What's the, what's the underlying morality of, of producing ice cream? And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, ultimately, the moral of producing ice cream seems to be to make rich people fat. That's what it does. And I like ice cream. I love it. I love it. I used to love Ben and Jerry's ice cream, but I can't eat it anymore. <laughs> but uh, there, luckily, there's a lot of competition. There's others. But um, what's, the, what's the morality of coal mining? What does it do? What's its moral purpose? Well, ultimately, it makes poor people warm. So you've got one product that makes rich people fat and great. We, got, we live in a fantastic modern world. And if you want to be fat, that's great. You can do that and eat lots of ice cream. But I also think we want people to be warm, too. We want people to be able to heat their homes and grow their economies. And coal mining does do that. So I'm happy to take the morality challenge uh, uh, for, for, for the fossil fuel industry against any other industry in the world any day of the week. And that is even becoming more clear, as I said at the start, when modern technologies can t rely even more heavily on energy and resources that fuel the world. Mining and resources have never, have never been as important to the world as they are today. So I don't know if we are going to end up, our civilization is going to end up like Rome one day. One of the biggest mines in the Roman Empire was uh, a place called Rio Tinto, a river called Rio Tinto. And uh, it was, uh, the, the mine remained dormant basically from the end of the Roman Empire until the late 19th century when a few British investors picked it up, formed a company called Rio Tinto on the back of this uh, rehabilitated mine. And now it's one of the biggest mining houses in the world. So we still do rely on the use and the responsible extraction of our mineral resources. That's why I support the industry, and that's why I think the future prosperity of our world depends on us continuing to do so. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and God bless. So, Minister Canavan, you've done uh, three really unique things. Uh, one is You've introduced us to a list of 210 factors that for a country that is uh, routinely in its political debate de uh, <laughs> weighing whether it's decline, in decline or not uh, might be a good list of 210 factors for us to go take a look at. <laughs> the second is um, pointing out the strategic importance of wombats, which I had no idea. Uh, rest assured, we have none of them. And that I don't think we be, export them. You yeah. don't? Okay, <laughs> You're right. not allowed to we'll have them. to check. And then the third is the morality of ice cream, which as someone who used to work at an ice cream store for seven years <laughs> uh, as a youth, I'm going to have to think about that one. So. <laughs> but three topics that traditionally don't come up here. I want to go back to where you started your talk, because it is a topic that has come up uh, a lot recently. And, and that is about the strategic importance of rare earths and minerals. Mm. Uh, and so you, you outlined a number of ways in which Australia produces minerals. You've outlined a lots of ways uh, that you plan to work with the US and others to make sure that there's a free and open trade market mm. for this. But one of the questions we grapple with a lot is, particularly in the context of rare earths, what is the strategic issue that we're concerned about? Is it because uh, we expect demand for these critical materials to increase? And, and you know, is that in the electric vehicle side of the equation? Is it for all of these phones that we're producing? Is it for the built environment as a whole? Are we concerned uh, about, as we were perhaps six or seven years ago, about the China factor, which is um, concerned that the producers of a lot of these minerals aren't going to be you know, free and openly yep. trading them. Yep. And then third, some of the places where they're produced, it, they're terrible stories about how they're produced. They're yep. not really produced very yep. well. What, what is the, the driving force for your concern in addition to the fact that you're kind of just in charge of that portfolio in Australia? Well, I, I think it's the, the, the concentration of their production at the moment, which worries people. Um, the, but starting with, with your first question, um, y yes, they're essential. I took the mobile phone as something we all know about. But they're used in semiconductors, they're used in many military uh, applications, they're used in space technology. These are essential ingredients for these, uh, these, these uh, uh, products that are, that are so essential to our, our strategic goals, um, whatever they be, uh, whether they be military, whether they be uh, uh, exploration in space, uh, uh, whether they just be you know, the basic demand of our people to have 
access to modern you know, tech technologies that make their lives easier. Uh, so that's principally why they're important. Um, now, of course, you know, uh, uh, iron ore is important for the world too. Coal is important for the world. Um, but the production of, those, of both iron ore and coal, just to take them as an example, is much more widespread across the world. Yeah. Uh, and so there's not the strategic risks, perhaps, of their, um, of their a disruption in their supply causing great havoc, because you can always go somewhere else. That hasn't been the case with particularly rare earths, as I outlined in the speech. You know, uh, China's been responsible for the vast majority of the production until recently. Uh, and look, I'm not trying to make a, 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 an overplay or over-exaggerate the, the, the China uh, perspective alone. I just don't think it's a good idea to have one customer. You know, I don't think if you're in any business, it's a good idea to have all your business with one, one client. Because you're vulnerable then, right? If something happens to that client, you know, you, it cause, can cause great disruption. So when we think about China, yes, you know, there's a risk that, they may, uh, that, that there may be a nefarious uh, disruption to supply. But it may just very well be the, be the situation that the, China, the Chinese economy falls over or, or, uh, or there's political instability, internal political instability, that then has a, has a, has a, has a, uh, a knock-on effect to, to our own economies because of a, an undue reliance on one, one supplier. Mm -hmm. So I just think it makes a lot of sense to diversify that supply. I think it's been hard, what's hard to diversify that supply is because mining is often not a, um, a high margin game except but for booms, you know, when there's a boom, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's high money, but my understanding of the rare earth market, because it's been so supplied by China, there hasn't necessarily been, you know, these, these, these $50 notes lying on the ground causing people to go and develop alternative areas. And that's, I suppose, the challenge we've got to think about is how do we encourage the production of those other um, minerals um, if there aren't the economic incentives to do so um, because we've got a strategic reason to do so. Mm -hmm. um, then finally, um, you mentioned the, yeah, the, the, the potential um, uh, uh, un unethical practices in some countries for the production of these. Look, I don't think that's something that's, that's um, uh, uh, only uh, an issue for rare earth or critical mineral yeah. production. Uh, I mean, the same thing again has <laughs> existed with copper for a long time. This, this copper can have you know, pretty, pretty terrible environmental effects if you don't manage it properly. Um, so, and diamonds as well, of course. So, you know, this is something we've always got to manage and, and challenge. So I don't think it's something specific to critical minerals, but it, it, it is something, of course, as, as, you know, people, as countries, I think, that want to ensure that there are good practices around the world that, you know, we should, should uh, impose, impose good standards. So you were just down at Sierra Week. I was there too, but I missed Gas Day, the colloquial right. Gas Day Wednesday, which I think you were there for. But one of the themes that I kind of picked up on, which I found reflected a little bit in your speech, is the Trump administration, both in Secretary Zinke and Secretary Perry, spoke a great deal about the economic, environmental, and moral sort of leadership that they see inherent in this term energy dominance that they use. Yeah. And yet lots of voices from industry were there saying, we understand that and we deeply appreciate you cheerleading for mm. an industry that contributes in important ways to, to US leadership. But at the same time, it was hard to look at what was happening with the steel tariff discussion and then also the signing of the TPP, the, what is the CPTPP? CP, well, I did CPTPP. CPTPP, I CPTPP. Yeah. okay. I, mean, I think we just go with TPP. Yeah. <laughs> without the US as being part of it. And yet some of the initiatives that you've agreed yeah. to are really trade-based ones, right? I mean, they're looking yeah. at trying to make sure there's a free and flexible and open market for these things. I mean, do you find, did you find that to be a theme of discussion that you were having as well? And, and is it something that's concerning to you? Well, look, I, I think if, to touch on a couple of things there, I, I, uh, I suppose I'd say at the outset that uh, you know, consistency from politicians is not necessarily always our strong suit, right? So, you know, I, I, I get that. I, I, yeah, I, 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 we've, we've said, you know, as, as a government, we don't uh, uh, think the, the, the decision to impose tariffs on steel and aluminium is the, is the right way to go. It's, you know, we, we've consistently for a long time supported free and open markets. But then again, I'll, I'll say, you know, that doesn't mean at certain times in Australian politics we haven't taken action to protect our industries and our jobs yeah. you know, at different times. So. I don't try and double guess the priorities of another nation's government, but of course we can at times say, well, we don't think that's the right decision, but you know, we'll work with now the administration on that. Um, uh, all, I suppose, the message I'm trying to get through in, in the speech and, and, and I think the lesson from Australia's experience as, a, as an exporter of energy and resources uh, is that 
uh, uh, it does work best when you have free and open markets because you do need to attract a lot of investment. You do need to build, you know, the, these relationships need to be built on trust over a number of years and decades. Uh, um, a lot, you know, the demand, take, take for example the, the development of the export coal and export iron ore industries in Australia. It didn't come from just Australian companies thinking, oh yeah, there's some people in Japan who want some coal and iron ore, let's, let's dig up a mine and sell that. What actually happened was Japanese companies and investors came to Australia and invest in Australia uh, to help develop those mines, mm -hmm. along with Australian companies, mm -hmm. uh, and build a long-term, almost vertically integrated relationship. Um, so, you know, the, the best basis for those types of relationships, I think, is a consistent uh, uh, outlook on, on free and open trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, then there's the, the issue, you know, how do you manage that in the context of not every country you're trading with is going to be your, your strongest ally or, or friend. Well, you know, the Australian government, we've certainly taken a consistent position over many years that we think helping countries grow economically is good for the world. Mm -hmm. You know, whether, almost whether they're friend or foe, with the exception, of course, that if they're pariah countries that are doing the wrong thing, obviously we'll cut off trade. But, you know, just because they're not necessarily a democracy or share exactly our values, we still think the best thing for the world is promote economic growth, promote trade, because uh, countries that trade together, do business together, uh, you know, tend to have better diplomatic relations as well. Yeah. So one more thing I want to talk about and then open it up to our colleagues here in the audience so they can ask you some questions. You also went to visit the Petronova facility and you talked a bit about the politics of the Adani coal mine in, in Australia. So. So Petronova, I'd love to get your perspectives on it, but you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is CCS is being touted a, a great deal and was mm. certainly down at Sierra Week, but has been by this administration a lot as one of the solutions to some of the environmental concerns about coal production yeah. and use, particularly climate change, because that's the one that uh, perhaps addresses most directly. And yet, what's difficult about CCS is Clearly, if you want to find scalable solutions to climate change, not enough capital is flowing into that solution. Yeah, yeah. It requires government subsidy and enhanced oil recovery on the back end to sort of yeah. make those deals work. Mm. For those in, that are concerned about and perhaps taking more drastic action to stop coal production for a variety of reasons, is, is there something that we can be doing to move CCS further and faster in a way that would alleviate some of those concerns and whether it alleviates those concerns or not, do you have a thought about how Australia can move forward on yeah. CCS? Look, I think the main objective with developing CCS technology is to get the cost down. Now, that's what needs to happen. Uh, um, yeah, it was, was great to go and see Petronova. It clearly works. What they're doing works. Technically, you know, they've been running for a year now. Uh, they're, they're meeting their objectives. They have a cash flow opportunity from that because they're using it for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, they'd love oil prices to be a bit higher than they are, but but it, but you know they've got a business model. You know, not not everywhere in the world you're going to have that, and certainly most of the areas in Australia, we don't have that immediate option to 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 finance a CCS project uh, through that. So it's got to be done for more environmental reasons, and therefore the, you've got to get the cost down because ultimately I don't think people will pay a large cost to do something uh, just just alone for reduction of carbon emissions. So we've, we've, we've got a program in place at the moment, the Australian Government will do a number of pilots to try and prove up the technology and, and, and help do that. At the same time, you know, I, I, there's, at least in, in our part of the world, there's not an immediate need to roll out CCS either to meet, say, Paris targets. Uh, so I don't think enough gets said about the developments of technology in, uh, in, in, in steam turbines. Uh, um, uh, um, so there's a focus on CCS because that, that's what could deliver net zero emissions in the long term. But, but people under Paris, and I know you guys are, are, well, are in pulling out, but we've, we've committed to reduce carbon emissions by 26 to 28% by 2030. That's our commitment. And you obviously don't need CCS to get there. Uh, some of the latest uh, high efficiency, low emission coal fired technologies can reduce carbon emissions by about 25% in a black coal environment, 40% if you're replacing a brown coal. Uh, um, super uh, subcritical with, a, with an ultra supercritical coal fired power plant. So that, you know, that, that's the sort of reductions we need. And if you look around the world, 14 of the countries around the world that, that have put in their, their, their plans to respond to Paris, they've identified using Healy technologies as a way that they're going to reduce their emissions. Now, most of those are in Asia, uh, in the Asia Pacific region. But that, they're gonna, those technologies reduce emissions in, in, uh, at a level which gets us some way down the road, and then obviously they'll need to be further consideration about what comes next in the decades to come. 
But you know, it just goes. Like, I, I, I am, I am uh, uh, fundamentally an optimist about the ability of the world to, to the ability of science and innovation to make things more efficient and therefore lower carbon emissions as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Okay, we'll open it up to all of you. Uh, we'll go over here. Please just state your name and affiliation and question in the form of a question if you can. Uh, hi, my name's Robin West. I'm with the Boston Consulting Group and formerly of this August institution. Um, I'd like to turn to natural gas for a second. Um, uh, you have a lot of natural gas, but it's virtually all being exported. And it's my understanding that there's a real problem internally of having access to natural gas. And my question is, are the uh, existing natural gas producers who are largely exporters, are they going to have to make gas available to the domestic market? It's largely in the mm -hmm. West. The demand is in the East. Mm. Infrastructure. This is a, 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 it strikes me as a, a very challenging situation yeah. and very challenging for these investors who in some cases have invested over $50 billion in these mm -hmm. plants. That's a great question, Robin. And uh, so you're right. There is, there has been an issue with shortages of gas in Australia in the last year. Um, it has coincided with the development of an export industry of gas from eastern Australia, as you say. Traditionally, the gas has been exported from well over in the west, and that market's not connected with. There's no pipelines across Australia that connect that up. Um, but while it's coincided with that, the principal cause of the shortage is a decline in the fields, the gas fields that have traditionally supplied Australia. So uh, their, their fields around the Bass Strait in between the mainland and Tasmania. They're just declining, they're getting old, there's, there's no oil, very little oil left. And so the cost of that is going up. Um, they're, they're, they're about re reducing their production by about a third over the next decade. And that's, that's causing a, a, an issue. Um, now, now, that's not to say that the gas export industry hasn't contributed as well What's happened there is they haven't, their production has not been as, 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 uh, as, as productive as they thought it would be and they've had to go and at times source gas from what have been domestic fields to, to fill their LNG trains, fill their contracts. So that has caused an issue. Now uh, um, we had a situation a year ago where the gas price in southern Australia was $14 a gigajoule. At the same time the gas price in Japan was $11 a gigajoule. Uh, it's pretty hard to explain how you could be the world's largest or becoming the world's largest gas exporter but paying the world's highest gas prices. That's, you know, it's pretty, pretty hard as a politician to get up in front of businesses and explain that. Now the reason for that were a lot of you know, contractual obligations that those investors you mentioned had. So we sat down with them and, and, and we did put in place a regulation which would ensure that we didn't have a shortfall. And we also made you know, strongly the point that hey, you can't be reducing our energy security while you're exporting it to the world. That just, that's not going to fly over the long term. And look, I must say, Robin, that we've, I, I find I think all of the companies get that. They understand that. And they've been able to work for us to deliver a better outcome. So we don't have that situation now in terms of prices. The price now is lower in Australia than it is overseas. Uh, the gas industry agreed to supply back a bit more to the domestic market at high, they're good prices, you know, they get paid a good price. We're not asking them to take a, a low price, they get paid very well for the gas in Australia at the moment. Uh, and so that, that's worked. And we, our market's very small compared to, you know, what we're exporting to the world. So we think this can be managed responsibly and we, I think we pride ourselves as, as a government to do so very transparently, always open discussion and I've had some great discussions with some of those investors here in the States over the past week, a few weeks. So. I think it's something that is understandable, reasonable, and we'll get through this, this transition period. It's funny, Minister Frydenberg was actually here the day oh, that yeah. got announced by the PM. Right. And, but it's actually, it's been an interesting thing to insert to the U.S. conversation about how you can have a lot of yep. gas and yet run into some situations where that yep. is possible. Okay, we'll do this and this right together. So this gentleman right here in the second row, just because we're going to run out of time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Sandy Apgar, CSIS. My focus is military infrastructure. And I understand that Australia has pioneered public-private partnerships, both in military and civilian infrastructure. Could you tell, they include, of course, energy, but uh, all of the other public functions that now are yeah. business, government, enterprises. Could you address just for a moment the key features of that and particularly how it might differentiate Canada, the UK, mm. we're way behind. I'm going to take 
take one more before yeah, you Yeah, that's that. a great question, Sandy. I'm probably not going to be able to enlighten you much about uh, the experience in the US or Canada and the UK. Uh, sorry, it's been a long... I used to do this for a living at KPMG, but that was 10 years ago now. Um, in terms of our experience with it and what we've done, it, it all came out of uh, a period of, uh, I think, what was broadly happening in the world at the time was privatisation. You know, we, we had large government debt, and so the, the, both the federal government and state governments privatised a lot of infrastructure that previously uh, was in public hands. Uh, and so out of that model became uh, a, a lot of thinking about how would you attract future investment in infrastructure and environment where the government's not doing it directly and uh, uh, doesn't necessarily have the, uh, the budgets or, or the, the organisations anymore to do it. And that's, that's, that's where this public-private partnership came in. And at its heart, Sandy, uh, that maybe I can have a chat with you afterwards if you're really keen, but at its heart, it's all just about sharing risk, right? Like, like, so if you're a private investor wanting to go build a toll road somewhere, well, you know, you can look at what the demand might be on that road, but of course, that demand on that road is dependent on what governments invest in in other roads on the network, because either those that feed it or compete with it, uh, and so there's a lot of risk there that can't be managed by the private sector alone. Or if they were to try to manage it, they'd, 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 it would be very, very costly. So what, what we, we try to do with those PPPs is to manage that risk. So some risks will come onto the government balance sheet through the contracts we write with private infrastructure companies. So if things change in certain ways, you know, they'll be compensated for that. That helps lower their cost of capital uh, and attract more finance to, to infrastructure. On the military side of things, typically though, it, 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 I mean, there's a spectrum here, right? So you could have the private sector take on almost all risks except for some so clearly sovereign risks. On the military side of things, typically the government takes on a lot more of the risk and the private sector, in a way, is often just constructing, you know, just uh, design, construct and build. And that's a pretty typical contract, obviously. But it, it, it's really just taking contracts that businesses, that governments do with the private sector all the time, making them a bit more complex, sharing risks, and we think you get efficiencies out of that. So I know that, that um, we've also had a lot of discussions with US administration officials about this. Uh, they've got a big plan to expand infrastructure here in the United States. And you know, we do think our experience is extractive for the rest of the world. Mm, interesting. Get right here, sir. Thank you very much for the speech. Uh, I'm a reporter from Hong Kong Phoenix TV. So my question for you would be, uh, President Trump signed uh, the tariff uh, order yesterday on steel and uh, aluminum. So how, but which does not uh, exclude Australia. So how would Australia react? The first question. Second question would be, do, does Australia regard China uh, more of a competitor or a partner in uh, energy export? Thank you. And um, what was your name, sir? Sen Hao. Sen, Sen Hao. Uh, well, thank you for that question. The, the, the first thing is uh, we remain in uh, constructive discussions with the U.S. administration about the application of the tariff decision. Uh, uh, you know, we are, we are hopeful that we have a very strong case uh, for an exemption. Uh, we don't export a lot of aluminium or steel to the U.S. and and, and the products we do export uh, typically are part of the United States supply chain. So, our company has our, our major steel maker in Australia, Blue Scope, has operations here in the United States, and and most of their exports are inputs into you know, a further manufacturing process here in the United States. So I think we have a strong argument from that, just from an economic perspective, uh, for an exemption. Uh, obviously, we'll, we have to just keep talking to the US administration and, and, uh, uh, and, and they'll make their decisions. As I said, you know, we don't think it's the, 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 it's not the best policy for the world, but at the same time, governments do do this from time to time and we'll work with them to uh, get the best impact for our country, uh, then that, that's my job. In terms of uh, China and energy exports, well, we've, they've been a partner with us, clearly. Uh, uh, um, fundamentally, China's been an excellent partner with Australia uh, in developing our mining and resources industry. Uh, they themselves have made significant investments uh, in our country. As I said, we, we don't always have to see eye to eye on every issue to not have a business and trade relationship, a strong business, trade and investment relationship with another country. Um, just recently, just last year, Yan Coal, a Chinese uh, coal company, uh, bought uh, most of Rio Tinto's coal assets uh, in, 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 in the Hunter Valley in Australia. Um, that's something, you know, we, we, we have a strict foreign investment review um, process, but, you know, we, as I said, we built our mining industry on the back of investment from different countries. So they're absolutely a partner, uh, and I hope that uh, that can continue because, 
I often do think the businessmen and, and those that trade are on the front line of diplomacy. They're often in there first to countries that don't have a diplomatic relationship or a strong one, and that's how you build, 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 a, uh, build, a, build a stronger relationship over time. If I can just say if one quick thing to, to, to segue then to India, um, uh, which you know, we, we certainly see as a, a key strategic economic partner for Australia going forward. Uh, again, you'd think, you know, traditionally, so we have a stronger, I'd say, uh, we have a more, more, more in-depth relationship with China than we do with India, despite India sharing cultural heritage with us, uh, a consistent language, uh, and we both like curry. Um, um, but, uh, uh, and cricket too, for that matter. We both <laughs> like cricket. We say the three C's, Commonwealth, curry, and cricket. But, you know, we don't have a lot of trade with India compared to China. China's our biggest trading partner. So therefore, we don't, be, almost because of that, the, the business relationship trumps uh, uh, the, the, the historical and cultural uh, commonalities we have with that country. So I'd love to see us expand our business of, you know, relationship with India as India grows, because uh, uh, that will then, you know, the, I, I often say those three C's aren't enough. We need a fourth C in commerce. That's what develops <laughs> strong and, and persistent relationships between countries over time. Yeah, it certainly reflects something that Secretary Tillerson came here and made a speech on and the, the strategic importance of building stronger ties within the Indo-Pacific yeah. in general. Well, Minister Canavan, I know you've got other meetings here uh, today, but on behalf of the Southeast Asia Program and the Energy and National Security Program, thanks for visiting CSIS. We hope you'll do it again sometime soon. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.